her my Grammys? Sure. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's been a week of disruptions, uncertainties, and for many losses. Um, so I really appreciate people setting the time aside and the energy to join us today, uh, whether in person or um, the majority of our audience is joining us online, which uh, is also a lovely way to, to, uh, to join these sessions. Uh, so our lecture topic today is about individual and collective responsibilities to challenging times, which is more pertinent than we would have imagined when we first planned today's event. Um, before I get started, I did want to acknowledge the work that's gone into planning uh, the organization of this event, with special thanks to, um, to Mike Crawford, to Angie Mitchell, to Kelly Bronson, and to Vanessa Solyovov for um, helping the event to run smoothly today. So we're here today to present the 19th Kelly Bang Memorial Lectureship with this year's honored recipient, Dr. Gail Whiteford. The Kelly Bang Memorial Lectureship was established to honor those whose research, practice, teaching, and advocacy advance opportunities for women and other marginalized adults within communities. As well, the lectureship recognizes the importance of the creative arts in personal and social visions. Kelly Bang was a graduate of Smith College in Northampton and received degrees from Columbia University and St. Francis Xavier University here in Nova Scotia. She was nationally known occupational therapist, a lecturer, a writer, an artist, and a counselor for people who had suffered from child abuse. In 1989, Kelly founded the Nova F uh, Functional Assessment and Therapy Services Limited in Lunenburg in Nova Scotia. Prior to that, she worked more than 20 years as an occupational therapist in hospitals in New York and in Nova Scotia. She was a longtime volunteer at Second Story Women's Center in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. Her strong support for Dalhousie School of Occupational Therapy assisted in the development of the undergraduate program, where she was a lecturer responsible for the OT program in program um, design and evaluation course. This lectureship was designed as a way to carry forward her legacy, reinforcing a commitment to communities and to those who experience social marginalization. We're so pleased to have the opportunity to welcome Gail Whiteford this year as our recipient, coming from Australia on her world tour <laughs> of sharing her expertise with us. And uh, Vanessa, who um, was um, madly online emailing people from all over the world to join us tonight <laughs> with the, for this session because she's noticed how wide your networks are internationally and wanted to make sure people knew you were presenting today. <laughs> so Shannon Phelan is going to introduce Dr. Whiteford and uh, following the presentation we're honored to welcome Dr. Liz Townsend to share the concluding remarks. So good evening, everyone. It's an honor to welcome Dr. Gail Whiteford for the Kelly Bang Memorial Lectureship as her many contributions to the fields of occupational science and occupational therapy are so well aligned with the spirit of this lectureship. Dr. Whiteford has been an active contributor to occupational therapy and occupational science for three decades. 
She is internationally known for research, practice, teaching, and advocacy related to the advancement of rights and justice for marginalized groups through her leadership in occupational justice, inclusion, and epistemic reflexivity. Her contributions to the profession have been recognized through awards from international bodies, including the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists and Occupational Therapy Australia. She was made an inaugural fellow of the Occupational Therapy Research Academy in 2017 and has four books and numerous refereed publications. She currently leads an international team of the World Federation of Occupational Therapists on the Occupational Narratives Database Project. And most recently, Dr. Whiteford led the pub and published a new book with OT Australia, which represents an intersection between occupational science and occupational therapy, focusing on diverse voices and narratives called Doing Our Best, Individual and Community Responses to Challenging Times, which we will hear about this evening. It explores the occupational strategies people have used to navigate challenging contexts such as COVID, floods, drought, and wildfires, something quite timely uh, given the impact of Hurricane Fiona and the challenging times we're facing in Atlantic Canada at present. I'm sure, I'm sure aspects of these stories will resonate with many of our experiences over the past week and the importance of uh, community, belonging, and connection have seems to come more and more tangible to me over this, this last week, and I imagine for others too. Uh, and also the unique ways that occupation and collective occupations can uplift society. So in summary, Dr. Whiteford has a deep commitment to equity, justice, and a strong social vision for, the occupational, for occupational therapy and occupational science, and it is an honor to introduce Dr. Gail Whiteford as the recipient of the Fall 2022 Kelly Bang Lectureship, and we trust that you will experience how she embodies the values established by Kelly Bang through her talk this evening. A testament to Dr. Whiteford's lifelong commitment to making differences in people's lives through occupation is the fact that she was awarded the Kelly Bang Lectureship in September 2000. Uh, so 22 years have passed and she continues to inspire a new generation of occupational therapists. So please welcome, uh, join us in welcoming Dr. Whiteford to the podium. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Shannon. I'd like to start with some acknowledgements this evening. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across which we meet this evening and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that acknowledgement to any First Nations people joining us this evening. I'd like to acknowledge the Department of Occupational Therapy here at Dalhousie University the Interim Director, Dr Kipek, and the Nominating Committee for the opportunity to give this lecture. It really is my honour and also my deep pleasure given the meaningful connection I've had with this department for quite some time now and I think this is my fourth time back here but all of that of course was enabled by my friend and learned colleague Dr Townsend. I'd like to acknowledge Kelly Bang herself, after whom this lecture is named in recognition of her community contribution. And through this lecture, her legacy lives on. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that many people in Atlantic Canada have been affected by this recent hurricane and that communities, families and individuals have been impacted upon and this will require time, energy and effort for them to recover. So on that note, it's been a challenging time for them and that perhaps is a segue for my talk this evening about challenging times. I don't know about you, but in the last couple of years, I think I heard the word unprecedented used in the media an unprecedented number of times. We seem to be confronted with a constant barrage of images and commentary on what was going on daily counts in particular during COVID, uh, homes lost during wildfires, 
impacts of floods, it all seemed to just come at us time after time. In Australia, I personally lived through these events. We started I have, on our property in Australia on six acres where we grow organic garlic with a drought. The drought lasted for several years and we had to buy water in to our property, which got scarier and scarier to not know where you're going to get your next drink of water from. Then after that, we had bushfires, as we call them in Australia, that raged around us. At one stage, I was telling Dr Kipik earlier, we had fires surrounding our property on three fronts. Uh, luckily, a helicopter arrived and was taking water from a dam below us from our friend's property to help extinguish a fire on the opposite ridge from our place. So uh, that was one of the scarier nights of my life. Luckily, the wind direction changed, so we, we got away from that one okay. Ironically, only about 18 months later, our town was hit by floods. It, it seemed unbelievable that that would happen after such devastation from the fires. And then, like all of you here, like everyone around the world, COVID came along. So there was a lot for people to deal with. However, in amongst those incredible circumstances and those challenging contexts, something was happening in communities and, and the word was filtering through that the stories were beginning to circulate in communities about people doing remarkable things. And it seemed to me that there was a lot to be learnt from these stories about how people responded with agency, with commitment to otherwise devastating events. And the rest is what I'm going to outline from here. So I took it upon myself to interact with Occupational Therapy Australia. I pulled together a proposal based on my sense that there was some learnings to be gleaned from the narratives of how people were responding with agency, what they were actually doing. And in particular, what these doings were, we would call them occupational strategies in response to these challenging contexts, COVID, wildfires, droughts and floods. It was, from the outset, not a project focused on resilience. I don't know about you, but I do really, I think we overuse resilience. I, I think we, it's a, what I would call a psychologised construct that slips into everyday usage in a way that we don't really critically engage with. And for me, as an occupational scientist, as an occupational therapist, I would ask myself, let's, what's behind that? What's behind resilience? What is it that people are actually doing that may or may not equate to resilience? So let's reach behind and try and understand that. So the focus was not to be on any particular context. Sure, there could have been a book about COVID. There are books about COVID already coming out. There's research being published. It could have been about how people responded to the disasters of the fires. But what seemed more important was not the context itself. All of them were very particular and had their demands, but rather the agency with which people responded. What they actually did was where the learnings to me seemed to be uh, where we should be engaging. Importantly, there are a few other dimensions to doing this book, and I do want to just show you the hard copy. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it later, but the hard copy is lovely to interact with. We've made it accessible in terms of size and font. There is an e-copy, and we're also doing an audio book at the moment, but I'll, I'll get to that later. It also was an opportunity for us to hear from diverse people, perhaps those that we don't always hear from in everyday life without these big mitigating, mitigating circumstances. So it was an opportunity to reach to and have those diverse voices speak back to us. 
It was a way for us to engage with different communities that, again, Occupational Therapy Australia and our profession at large might not interact with so actively or perhaps so purposively. And in particular, I want to make mention of this being an opportunity through which to engage with our First Nations communities in Australia. And I will come back to talk about that as a very special element of this project. The intention was always to show rather than tell what the domain of concern is of occupational therapy. I don't know about you, but I've gotten a little tired of us telling people what our domain of concern is. And it seems to me that that's a professional voice and that really what we could be doing more powerfully is standing with and illuminating the voices and experiences of others. So uh, I've got a little tired of us perhaps being like adolescents are uh, constantly asserting an identity. I think now we've in an adulthood of profession where we don't need to keep doing that. Instead, we can work alongside and, and show our primary concern, and that is always, of course, an occupation. The project was a way of enacting solidarity with communities that were really devastated by all these contexts, who had lost everything in many circumstances. Communities where rates of mental illness due to the isolation of COVID were going through the roof. With people in institutions who had double layers of isolation because they had no access to technology. And finally, to stimulate some reflection on what these occupational strategies were a little more actively before they got lost. I think already we might have lost some of the knowing through the doing. So it's been an attempt to really capture that. But importantly, and I do think that this is a concept that I, I remember having a conversation with Dr Townsend about when we worked on the participatory occupational justice framework in its first inception back in 2005, that hope is a really important element in our work with people. And it's important not to forget that, that fostering hope and facilitating hope can be important and very powerful to people. So a unique project was born. And I'd, I'd have to say that it's important to give credit to Occupational Therapy Australia on this front. They took the proposal that I pulled together. They committed a budget to it, which, as we know, is tough for professional associations. They're not exactly flush with funds. But they saw the value, the importance of it, and said, yep, we're going to do this. So it was uh, unanimous across the executive. And from there on, we set off on a stepwise process. What was really important it was the transparency of the process. So uh, we agreed that we needed to call for expressions of interest from occupational therapists from around the country. And in particular, we wanted to sample for diversity. So we asked people to join who represented different communities, for example, people from rural remote communities, which uh, have their own unique challenges in Australia, as they do in Canada. People from GLBTIQ communities, people from communities of persons living with disabilities, from students, people who are re relatively recently new graduates, and also from First Nations communities. So having got that call out for expressions of interest to be on this project team, led by my good self, uh, we got yeah, a, a lot of responses and had to then make some decisions about who'd be part of that team. What we were after there was some organic reach into those communities as well. So once I had my team assembled, we refined our purpose statement. So I took the original proposal and worked on it a bit. We worked on a story structure to assist people to generate their narratives. The reason for doing that was so we could have some coherence to those narratives. So the basic structure went something like, who are you? Where are you? Context being really important. What was 
it that you did or that others around you did? And then what, what did that mean? And a thousand word limit on that. We took a really good decision at that point to also uh, include a request for people to submit images with their stories. And I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that we did that. You'll see some images as we go through and the images are as powerful as the narratives. What was also important was that we had a process of transparency about how we handled the narratives that came to us from around Australia, from all sorts of people, all sorts of backgrounds. And what I didn't want to happen is that people would say, well, Gail, you only chose that story because that's your cousin <laughs> or your, you know, someone you know or it's someone on the committee's uncle, whatever. We didn't want that. So even though quite a few people on the committee were very unused to things like double blind reviewing processes, it was really important to have that. So every story arrived, it had no name, it was only identified by number and each two people on the committee then reviewed it and gave it a score. And above a certain threshold was inclusion or not. Knowing that some stories we sent back to people and said, could you rework this a little bit or make it a little bit different? I do want to point out that we didn't require the stories to be in text. Uh, again, to make it accessible, we asked that people could narrate their story if they were didn't want to write or unable to write, that they could use augmented communication, that they could do a recording. So we want to make sure that we were getting that call out to people with as diverse backgrounds as possible. And quite a few of the stories in the book actually are people who narrated their stories or submitted them in other formats. So Then the fun bit came, which was developing the style guidelines for the book. I don't know who of you have worked with graphic designers. It's really a fabulous thing to do because they have such a special skill set. They bring knowledge and skills to the table that we don't have. And we similarly asked for submissions from a couple of graphic designers. We chose someone that we liked the best and we were off, off and running with the graphic designer of our choice. So the call for contributions went out around the country and people have asked me, well, how did that work? How did, how did that call for stories get to people? And I would say, I couldn't tell you exactly how, except that it was organic. People got word out to people that they knew, to friends, family, communities. They did it through professional networks. They did it through personal networks. It just didn't matter as long as the call for stories got out there. And there it was. The, I'd have to say that uh, one thing about working with a graphic designer, you get different interpretations. And probably the input of the association you could see there on the back cover, they did want, from a corporate perspective, the colours to be represented. And fair enough, they were supporting this project. They were bankrolling it. So they had input too about the look and feel of the book. That was a separate kind of input, input from what we were having on the team. From the outset, we were philosophically committed to ensuring that it was a strong acknowledgement of First Nations communities. In the frontispiece there, we have an acknowledgement of country, which acknowledges traditional owners, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag, but also throughout the book, all versions. In the top corner of the story, you'll see as we go through, there's a map of Australia with the name of the town or the city and in English, and then there's the Aboriginal name for that area. And we worked really hard with communities to make sure we got those right and that they were included in that naming process. And I, I think, again, that was an important statement about the lands across which we were reaching to access those stories. Importantly, and for me it was um, a point that I felt that I wasn't neg going to negotiate on, was to ensure that there was a dedication to uh, Professor Anne Wilcock in this book. As Dr Wilcock's first doctoral student, 
I felt that this was the kind of project that she would just have loved. In fact, uh, there were times when I used to have conversations with Anne when her aspirations were greater. She used to suggest that we should have a television show about doing and, and being and being well. But this dedication was important here because up until this time, unlike other places and other uh, journals, for example, had made a tribute to Dr Wilcock. We hadn't done that in Australia yet, so this was a really important opportunity to do that, but a really appropriate one as well. What's important here is that there's not an author. So I'm not an author. If anyone's an author, overall it's Occupational Therapy Australia, but really all the people who contributed to this, all the voices, all those narratives, we would consider them all co-authors. And I'm going to talk about that a bit towards the end and what that has meant. Okay, so there we were. We'd got these stories coming in from around Australia, really varied from people from aged nine to aged 89, all walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds. We'd reviewed them and we'd settled on the number that were going to be included in the book. And then as a process of I wouldn't call it analysis, it's certainly not at the level that you would do in qualitative uh, analysis, but there was a clear delineation of where the narratives were, were focused, and that was in doing, doing with and doing for. It was really interesting that we just, and almost the same numbers in each of those categories. So that was something that Dr Wicks, as my deputy in this project worked on together and it was, uh, it was kind of a magic to, to how that happened. Some overlapped, but pretty clearly we saw these three categories. So at the top of the screen there you'll see uh, the map of Australia and the name is Melbourne and Waiwurrung, which is the Aboriginal name there. So that's on every story. The narratives around doing were intriguing, just intriguing the level of knowing through doing that people articulated. In this story, for example, a woman who's in isolation during COVID, uh, distance actually in Melbourne, which was the most locked down city in the world, had the longest lockdown in, in the world, isolated from children, isolated from grandchildren, recently bereaved, she decided to recreate her home village in Myanmar from when she was a child using recycled materials. Okay, doesn't sound like such a big deal, but for her it became something got, that got her out of bed every day and she got more and more into the detail, researching it, going back to photos, communicating with her family back in Myanmar, and went to a level of detail that was phenomenal. And she says this process, this doing, gave her a renewed sense of purpose. And she came out of lockdown in pretty good mental health state. So that creative response, but also for her revisiting her identity in, in a very unique way. I also have uh, read recently some work by a neuroscientist who suggests that we get we have the highest dopamine levels in our life between age seven and 29. That, and so that in revisiting things we've done and experiences we've had in childhood actually gives us a bit of a dopamine hit. So I'm wondering if that was possibly going on for her too. This is one of my favorite stories from Ben. And Ben starts his narration by saying, Spend speaking. I can't write, so I'm getting my dad to write this down. And what was powerful about this story was that actually that he's, he talks about being a bit lost in time. And maybe that was really common for a lot of us because time was less differentiated during COVID with everyone being at home. 
So he lost a lot of his occupations. He did spend a lot more time, as he says, working on his car collection. But for him, actually, the, the doing was getting his jabs as a vulnerable person. That, that made him feel safe and made dealing with the doing and lack of doing during COVID uh, OK. Heartwarming, that one. This uh, woman from Western Australia talks about what it took to come out and decide to be a volunteer firefighter. So her doing was about feeling a sense of responsibility, living in a community, being a bit uh, scared, a bit worried about what was going to happen and whether she would also have the skills to be a firefighter and what it took, the courage it took to go and do that. But ultimately, that being the most rewarding thing that she'd done. I don't know about you, but this is possibly a question many of us asked about uh, during the time of COVID. What, what are we going to do? What is it that we're going to do with ourselves? And what can we do that maybe is a bit productive and it's going to make a difference to our lives? And again, this is a very everyday story. There's nothing dramatic about this. But someone deciding that having never gardened in their life, they were going to go and get the veggie garden going and that they might have their own fresh vegetables to eat. And what a joy that was to their life. Very every day, but there's, again, there's an innate wisdom in there. Doing with... The story's changed in doing with, which is a sense of connecting with others and the meaning that came from that. In this response to floods, again, people were reflecting on how quickly these events happened, how shocking it was that it was hard work and stinky work, but how it felt to have that closeness of community and working with strangers uh, from all walks of life to do something really important and getting together and cleaning up. And I can't emphasise, pardon me, in Australia, how much we were reliant on community effort to respond to bushfires, floods in particular, we had a bit of a crisis of emergency responses. There weren't people there. There weren't crews to help people. There weren't you know, the supports coming in. So we, many communities were reliant, were reliant on each other and the things that they did to respond. I really want to stress that. A different story again about a family, a close-knit family who all played music together in preparation to stream online to their church. On Sunday, they normally would have been there and what that meant to them to all be in one place with their musical instruments, but every week producing a new musical piece to share with their church members. Uh, one of my favorite stories is this one because of the, the drought connection and because of the rural connection. Farmers did it so tough in our country that many of them actually had to walk away from properties that they'd held in their families for generations and were bankrupt and left without very much at all. And in this one particular area in, in Victoria, this group decided in the community that they were going to respond to the most difficult conditions they'd had and very tough times by having a great Australian tradition, which is a game of cricket, <laughs> community cricket. And, you know, as this person says, we hadn't got together for years because people had got more and more isolated by the drought, uh, more and more worn down by circumstances, and people were struggling. And as I said, some of them just had to pack up and walk away. So if ever there was a, a doing that was about hope and connectedness, this story really resonates on that. Doing four. Uh, these are numerous stories here. It was very hard to, for me to select some stories out for you because, as I said, it's hard to represent the diversity. But... I think, again, fitting with the theme of Kelly Bang and her interest in the arts, I think this quote is really apt, and that is that in making this film, that it was about art 
being a wound turned into light, the story of making the film. So this documentary maker, a filmmaker, who's lost his house in the fires in Conjola, decided the only way to respond was creatively. And he had spoken to community members who said, we need to heal. So he went about working with that community to produce this documentary, Our Fire, Our Stories. Interestingly, the film went on to win awards here in Edmonton, in LA and in New York, and has been nominated for Best Film and Best Director Award in Australia. Just want to pick up, so that's the poster for the film. You can stream this film if you want to see it. I, I recommend it. It's pretty challenging. Uh, as the narrator of the story says, you'll, you'll laugh, you'll cry. But it's represented a major step forward for the community. He was worried that people in the community would find it too confronting. So in the first couple of public screenings, he worries that, you know, this might be too much for people. He speaks here about them wanting their voices to be heard and addressing obvious questions of climate change, indigenous land management practice. In Australia is a little controversial because traditionally indigenous owners would burn land so that major bushfires wouldn't come along and that we should be returning to those sorts of practices. Uh, as I said before, obvious, not so obvious, and obvious failures of emergency services. People didn't come. And that meant levels of destruction that had, were unseen before. But importantly, he says that this film puts the viewer in the line of the fire, in the line of fire, interesting use of uh, words there, and ask, what would you do in this situation? In this narration, the person picks up the fact that they can see that people are being really affected disproportionately because of they come from a disadvantaged background. And in the floods, people who were most affected were those who were living in what I think you would call a trailer park here, uh, in trailers. And the floods came through because they're on the lowest lying, most available and cheapest land, tended to lose everything. And so that meant that it was harder for them to recover. Assistance was there sporadically from our governments, but it was slow. And this person who comes from a health professional background said that they were really part, proud to be part of a, a community that, that responded in a caring way. None of what I did was particularly high-tech, complex or magical. And they're referring there to uh, the fact that someone had had a snake bite they thought they had a snake bite, so what they did was a very low-tech response, drew a line, a ring around what the snake bite area might have been and just to see if it, if it got worse or if it got redder, and none of it did, so. This is Peyton, age nine, and we kept her original handwritten story in there. And I, I think we were all really moved by this story when it came in. She had heard about the book through someone maybe at school and had said to her mum that she really wanted to write her story about what she noticed in the bushfires. And at the heart of her story is what she noticed was that even though she was really scared and they were very close to the, the front of the fire, was that people came and helped each other, and as she says, that made me happier. So she was reassured to see that people were coming together, they were doing things together, they were enacting that sense of community, and that was deeply reassuring to her. This is an interesting one about how we have to be careful about 
what we do, how we provide assistance and how people might respond in context. So Rotary Club, you have Rotary here in Canada? Okay, the Rotary Club in, this is actually in the area I live in, decided to set up a community pantry. You use the word pantry here? Yeah, okay. Because people in um, the farming communities during the drought were really running out of food. But these are not people who were going to ask for help and were very proud people. So what they did in setting up this community pantry was to have a place where you could come and have a cup of tea, Australians love a cup of tea, have a chat, and oh, there just happened to be some food there. And as the narrator says, people were not so comfortable, again, because these are farmers, these are people who grew food and produced food, who were facing you know, levels of starvation. But people felt that they could trade so in comes, for example, a woman with buckets of cucumbers and said, oh, here's some cucumbers and oh, it's OK, I'll take some rice and some flour then, that's a bit of a trade. So that, there was a level at which people felt comfortable to receive assistance and support. And the final story in the book is by Uncle Albert Baxter and he says, I'm a proud Yorta Yorta man with elder responsibilities. Community members like to sit and have a yarn with me. That means to have a discussion. A yarn is a really important cultural concept in Indigenous communities. I just listen and I can offer advice and that's where I get a lot of my satisfaction. I've been talking more recently about the importance of representation and I want to make note here that uh, Uncle Albert and Kerry, who was our... First Nations representative on the group, worked together. They chose this the image um, uh, from many, and that's because Uncle Albert is wearing, they're both wearing a traditional possum skin cloak, and th these are the kind of things that were barred or um, disallowed in the early years of colonisation and oppression, and most recently, traditional owners have gone back to recreating the possum skin cloaks and what they signify and each one's made uniquely to represent aspects of country. Um, I don't know more than that and, and probably it's not my, my place to have that knowledge but they were very clear and Uncle Albert was very clear that that's how he wanted to be represented in this book. And following on from that, let's look at what the stories tell us. There's some themes, but this has not been the subject of a full qualitative analysis. We're just discussing the complexities of doing in-depth qualitative data analysis. Doing is an inherent way of knowing in response to change circumstances. That doing provided structure, temporal location and, and differentiation in time because people did feel that they're in a sea of time during COVID and that they lost sense of normal time during the emergencies of bushfires and floods. Doing was therapeutic. It definitely assuaged people's anxieties. Doing with provided opportunities to connect with others creatively, productively. Doing with was collectively productive, healing, fun and for those moments transcendent of the really challenging context that people found themselves in. And doing four seemed to allow people to have an opportunity to serve the bigger purpose rather than their own needs and again I think there's some really important learnings for us there. Uh, we can get a bit engaged with the doing for others that have range of needs but actually it's innate to all of us to have that desire to contribute to others and serve others. Caring for others, caring for the environment. There's some very good stories in here about care, regenerating environments after floods and fires, but also caring for community. There were some unexpected outcomes. Feedback from the contributors has actually been much more powerful than we had imagined. The gist of the feedback is that through the narrating of their stories 
and then having it pulled into a publication has been significant to them and to their lives and to their identities. So in particular, one of the stories in here is about a young man who takes up em embroidery during the pandemic and also at that time decides to come out online to his community and his friends and what that meant to him. We've also heard feedback that Ben, young Ben in the book, is very proud to show people the book when they arrive and say, I'm in here, this is my story. We gave every person that contributed a hard copy. That was, again, another really important element for the book. Someone has reported to us that they've come out of a significant depression and that part of that for them was that they felt validated, that their story, what they did, was recognised and that it counted and that that validated their experience and who they were in a, in a very powerful way. So we didn't foresee any of this. And I think, you know, when I, as a qualitative researcher, there's probably something there to go back and explore perhaps. But certainly to me it seems that there's power in the illumination and representation, but that people have ownership of that. We have had a lot of community and institutional interest in, in local stories in particular and local media. The connection with Uncle Albert has been delightful. He's gone on to act in an advisory uh, capacity with the association uh, in, as part of our reconciliation action plan nationally. And he's been at conferences recently as someone who's he's signing the book. I love that. I think that that shows a, a sense of ownership of the whole thing. And isn't that better that he's signing it than anyone else connected with the project? So that's been a, a really heartwarming outcome. The book is also being used at the moment with service providers, funders, policy makers, political representatives to show, again, to do that showing of what our domain of concern is through the voice of people we serve in communities for education and research purposes. It has been taken up by occupational therapy programs. I do think it's a good resource for both research and also for students. Finally, what does this project tell us about the relationship between occupational therapy and occupational science? At the heart here we have occupational science, which is about the know that, and the know that is that occupation is a complex situated phenomenon. Occupational therapy is the know-how to enable occupation, occupational participation, social inclusion, using occupational strategies where possible. Now, the, this relationship and the complexity of it and the development over time is a whole other presentation. Uh, I'm not going to go into more detail on that, but Suffice it to say, this is a relationship that has developed over time. Some of the key contributors to that uh, are in the room and joining us from other places, but the synergistic interaction is one that we're really seeing the dividends of, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Of course, it's always in a context. The relationship between occupational science and occupational therapy has been informed by diverse epistemologies and knowledge traditions over time. Also, many discourses, many ideologies, many theories and many movements have influenced that development. Also, we sit in an international and national context and I think COVID really brought that home to us that we can't sit aside from those. However, we, on the basis of this important relationship between occupational science and occupational therapy are now in an ideal place and are speaking back to these international and national drivers in a way that we're influencing what's happening in those spaces in an increasingly powerful way. And I want to give you an example. In advancing a justice of participation, we're speaking back to the people who have power institutionally, we're speaking to governments, we're speaking to policymakers. 
And I'm not sure how it is here in Canada with your national association, but I'm really proud to see that Occupational Therapy Australia has taken a much more politicised role in interacting with, again, those decision-making bodies in Australia. In the last year alone, I just got this data through from the CEO two days ago, we've made 44 submissions to state and federal inquiries and hearings standing committees, and in previous, previous years, we've appeared personally at Senate inquiries, for example, on the treatment of asylum seekers, on issues ranging from mental health service provision, aged care service provision, classification, disability funding, veterans' rights, and home-based services for people with chronic conditions, one of the key areas of our time in terms of funding. What's made this possible has been the development of position statements on a lot of those key issues in society. What's made the position statements possible is this clear, unambiguous commitment to occupation as our domain of concern. And I'm on the homeward stretch now. What's made this possible and what does it represent? A couple of years ago, when I had the great honour to do the Sylvia Docker lecture in Australia, I proposed that where we're at and what we need to consider now is not just occupational justice, but occupational justice plus. That ways of and opportunities for doing combined with ways of knowing and epistemic justice in which we foreground different knowledge traditions alongside ways of being, being represented and understood or hermeneutic justice is actually where the most powerful, collaborative and transformative work can happen. These days I'm inclined to think that occupational justice alone is not sufficient and this represents a way in which we work powerfully with people and this brings me back to the issue of representation and people having rights of representation of their assigned identities, the identities that they choose to have. So we are collectively in our communities around the globe in a very, very important historical moment, having con confronted the structural inequalities that were really made apparent through the challenging times in which we and the occupational disciplines have the ability to realise our social contract. But this is one of my favourite proverbs. As the African proverb reminds us, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. So in working together, occupational scientists, occupational therapists, in all roles, in all settings, with diverse people, from diverse backgrounds, needs, identities, aspirations, knowledge traditions, as self-defining, self-determining citizens. It's possible that together we really can go further. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now from the viewers or from people in the room. Sure. I'll repeat the question after you've asked it so people can hear. Okay, so I'll paraphrase that question. So the question is, was there anything in the narratives that was new or surprising to me? And also, what was in the narratives that perhaps is informing people uh, who are service providers and people out there going forward? Great question. 
I, I was surprised by the, the innate knowing that people had about what to do and how to do it. Uh, they didn't need us, <laughs> although we're, you know, theoretically the experts on doing. Uh, people really had a sense of what what they needed to do to deal with really extreme conditions, and sometimes not a, not so extreme, but the pressure of not having anything to do in a sea of time. So there was an innate doing that just blew me away as I read the stories. In terms of what might be useful to inform service providers, to, to, for those in communities, for health professionals, for educators, I think it's that we need to remember that people would probably rather be a pr provider of care or service or doing for others rather than be a recipient of, of care and service provision. That that gives them a, a very that gives people a very different sense of identity of agency to be. Yeah, I'm not the person that's getting help or care. There were quite a few people who had a range of needs and disabilities, but they were volunteers helping pack sandwiches or do whatever. So they, that sense of I'm actually doing something that because someone else needs it, I'm not the recipient of, of, of that was powerful for people too. And we shouldn't forget that. Uh, and we should be, I guess, focused on providing opportunities in which people can engage in those ways. So uh, that would be one of the lessons, but also us facilitating opportunities and resources in which people can enact their innate ways of knowing. Uh, again, that's what I mean about epistemic justice. It's not that we know everything or necessarily that we know how to do it. People know based on where they come from and their unique identities. I was very moved by that. Does that answer the question? Great. Any other questions? Any online? Okay, we might finish there then. Well, Gail, <laughs> I'm Liz Townsend, and I'm so honored to be able to thank you again for coming back to Dalhousie uh, many, many times. You've inspired me since we met in about 1998, I think it was. And today you've given us lots to think about to inspire people in many different contexts. Um, I think about people who are practicing occupational therapy and your inspiration to focus on what people are doing and help them to tell their stories and to show, particularly as you have illustrated through the book, but to show you in images and, and whatever way what their issues are in doing uh, in their particular challenges. So I, I think that you challenge practitioners to really take that focus forward. Uh, whatever institutional pressures there are to focus on something else, are, we're there to focus on the doing. And I want to bring to you greetings from Dr. Tanya Packer, whom you know, but whom you met in New Zealand, probably in the, somewhere in the 80s? 90s. 90s. <laughs> Uh, and Dr. Tanya Packer was a director at this school, so she was in New Zealand at the time that she met Gail. She's been to Aust uh, Tanya Packer has been to Australia, and her mother actually is from Nova Scotia, so she's back here. And I ran into her on the street as I was walking over and told her, you were giving the lecture, and she couldn't come. She was all tied up, but she said, please give Gail my best wishes, and thank you for coming back again. And with that, I... Thank you on behalf of everybody else for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. And I offer a little token if you will come back and just uh, accept this on behalf of us all. Thank you so much. Thanks.
Nikki? <laughs> Apparently that's the grand finale. For those of you who are off-site, uh, it was just a little bit of uh, final things. So thanks for attending everybody here and wherever you may be. I mean, maybe somebody's in Australia for all I know. <laughs> Pardon me? Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Cheers. Bye. to hear about, I think.